Welcome to Householders, a conversation about American life as Zen practice. I'm Inga Annie Wade. And I'm Kyosaku John Mitchell, and we're lay members of the Atlanta Soto Zen Center. Are you as sleepy as I am? <laughs> yes, very much. That's almost the the mental problem that's top of mind for me. But the thing that I'm having the most trouble with these days is switching contexts. Have we talked about this? Um, no. I feel like it's actually a pretty good buddhist challenge or problem or obstacle like there's a paradox the more you practice staying with whatever's happening well actually i can already see the sort of the fallacy of my thinking i you know there's there's a there's a sort of present moment bias in a lot of maybe more secular kind of mindfulness talk that we have talked about, which is like, you can't do, you can't do multiple things at once. You can't, you have to, you have to do one thing at a time Mm -hmm. and put uh, every single ounce of attention and energy you have available into the thing that's happening. You have to change your whole life around so that there are never any distractions. And it feels like the Zen alternative to that is something more like you have to roll with whatever happens that be, being quote unquote present is really about being flexible and adaptable to whatever's happening mm-hmm. and being able to adjust if something surprising or unexpected happens. And I get that, but I feel like there is a very long stretch in the life of practicing Zen where what's happening for me is I'm getting drawn deeper and deeper and deeper into my present experience so much so that it feels like it's getting harder for me to switch contexts quickly. And what just to be clear and practical and householders about what's actually happening, you know, I'm working at home. Mm-hmm very, very frantically, like it's a busy, complicated job. And I walk out of my door to go to the bathroom and there's like a full blown two child meltdown happening, Oh, which is the kind of thing I know how to handle, but it requires springing into action. And if I'm still thinking about the thing I'm in the middle of, you know, there have, there's like a dropping everything that has to happen. And that dropping everything has become really hard for me to do. That's understandable. Yeah, I guess it is. But I don't know what I don't know how to like there, there's I guess the reason it's complicated. The reason I, I'm bringing it up is because it feels like I shouldn't actually get like it like it feels like a multi like multitasking is what I'm being asked to do. And it feels like I shouldn't do that. Yeah. I feel like I'm supposed to multitask according to the world around me and multitasking feels like something that I shouldn't have to do or don't want to do and it and and I I uh I feel some resistance to like switching contexts like that even though it's what I well, what's being asked. Well, of me. gosh, John, I mean, yeah, that's super tough. I mean, I I feel like people try really hard to compartmentalize, you know, uh mm-hmm. with work and home. And now, you know, with the pandemic, it's like our work is our home, but maybe there's still ways to compartmentalize. Like I, I compartmentalize in the way that it's like the computer is work. So Mm -hmm. when I'm on the computer, I'm doing work. And when I'm not on the computer, I'm not doing work. Oh, that's really sane and healthy. Yeah. Except for like (laughs) when I do want to be on the computer and not do work. Now, everything I do on the computer, regardless of whether it's work, feels like it's a work context. Right. Then what do you do? So, but anyways, now you don't really have that option because, you know, the 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 girls are going to do what they're going to do and they don't yeah. know you're at work or care that you're at work. The, so. older, the, the older one does actually. She gets the idea. She wants, she, it's not that they're asking for me, you know, well, I mean the baby 
the baby's asking for whatever the baby's asking for. Yeah. But but the, it, it's just that like I end up in a situation or even even if everything's fine, like I come out of the office for dinner time and, you know, I have to like figure out what to make and I'm staring into the refrigerator seeing just like the matrix, you know, like there's no like like actual like yeah. connection to what's 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 in there in my mind and then you know i get everything on the table we're sitting at the table and now we're talking and you know two-year-old language and and my wife's you know trying to you know make plans or do whatever talk about talk about uh some other thing than than what i've been thinking about all day and it's just like static like i can't i can't switch into it uh, it's really not on them. It doesn't feel like it feels like I have to change the channel somehow. <laughs> yeah, change how. the channel. Um, what is what is a Buddhist way or technique of of changing the channel? I mean, mm-hmm. I guess deep breathing in between like work and home, mm-hmm. but not not that you always mm-hmm. have the option. If they're having a meltdown, then it's like you got to go deal with that. Yeah. You might not have time for some breathing, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but some kind of transitional thing. Do you have transition practices that you do to help you switch? Like from from being awake to being asleep. Yeah, mm-hmm. like I have this really long ritual. <laughs> it takes me like an hour to get ready for bed. Tell me about that. Uh, I mean, and most of it's like a lot of what people would do. But why do you relate to it as a ritual? Because I, I have to do it to go to sleep. Mm. But I've added stuff onto it over time because and now when I do it, I actually get tired. Cool. So I've, I've done it for so long that I'm just like, OK, it's time to get ready for bed. And even if I wasn't tired before I got ready for bed, the act of getting ready for bed now makes me tired. Oh, man, that sounds useful. Yeah. I mean, so I I have to wash my face, wash the makeup off. And so um, and then do my skincare routine. And then, of course, brush your teeth, floss your teeth, meditate for a little bit. I might read something. I might stretch. It depends. One of the three. And then I have to take my pills and I have to put Vicks Vapor Rub underneath my nose. Hmm. <laughs> I have to put chapstick on and lotion on. And I can't fall asleep unless all those things. Oh, and the heating pad. I hmm. It's weird. I sleep with a heating pad every night. Uh, but some somehow like the warmth like makes my back not hurt Mm because i guess probably from sitting in the chair Mm -hmm. but um i'm working on that (laughs) uh that helps my back but also like the warmth makes me feel sleepy too and comforted Mm -hmm. so i do all those things and if i wake up in the middle of the night i have to do a lot of those things over again wow yeah (laughs) My therapist was like, that sounds a little compulsive. I'm like, yeah, but uh, I don't know. I just, I have to do it. So I does, is it, do you think, do you think that's a fair observation? Cause like, isn't it also the case that it makes you tired and so it works. And so isn't that also just like yeah. adaptive and good? Well, sure. I don't think it's like caused any problems in my life except for, yeah. I mean, I went to, to Austin, Texas and I had to be like straight up with my sister I'd not bring all the things that mm. I have to do before bed and I have to do them. So do you have those things? <laughs> like, do you have a heating pad? Do you have fixed vapor rub? You know, like, mm. uh, cause I didn't bring those things. So, but once I did that, I had like really good sleep and mm-hmm. it's just something I have to do now. The, the smell one is jumping out to me as a pretty interesting, uh, adaptation i'm wondering how you came to that practice or oh where, well it where, doesn't where wasn't it for the smell it was because uh, i have allergies year round because mm. i'm allergic to dust and uh-huh. the only way for me to fall asleep is if my nose is at least open enough for me to do so mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah but so that's that's i see that is not really about the smell but like that it, do you think that there is some kind of associative thing Probably. I mean, now that I smell it, it probably does remind me of going to sleep. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of those things do. It's become, you know, just like adaptive, like you said. I mean, I think we have, you know, we have morning rituals, too. It's like you drink your coffee. 
mm-hmm. the morning. I don't drink coffee, but you know that's something people do. I do. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if it's it, it, it's obviously it is to a degree about the caffeine, but I wonder if like that also transitional period of like drinking mm-hmm. the coffee is part of you transitioning into your day. I've agonized about coffee so much for so many years because I never stimulants are not uh, worth the if side effects for me most of the time. Like I, I went, if I had my ideal life, I wouldn't need caffeine in the morning because I mean, I drink, a I drink a, like a cup of matcha, which is like 20% of a cup of coffee yeah. uh, before I sit at five in the morning. And that makes the difference between falling asleep and falling over and hitting my face against the door uh, and sitting perfectly fine through an hour of Zazen in the morning. Like that's different. But then there's the sort of booster rocket of a cup of coffee that I, that I need to time exactly right so that it leads to productivity and, and happiness and good mood and not freaking out. And like, there've been so many different periods of time where coffee has been so important, uh, in my, in my brain preparations every day. And then I, I always reach a point where it's like anxiety and stress and anger and like all of these, all of these over adrenaline responses to things like just being so freaked out about whatever's happening and realizing that it's not actually a big deal. Nothing that important is, is wrong. It's just that like, something is a little bit off and my heart is racing and my brain is coursing with adrenaline. And and if I just hadn't, you know, guzzled stimulants, I would probably be handling it much better. And so I, I come around and I'm like, I got to quit drinking coffee. And I do the whole detox, the whole like month of pain that, that it always causes me to stop drinking coffee. And then I have like a week or two where I feel liberated. Like I'm free of the beast and then I just realized that like, I just don't have, I just don't have what it takes anymore. And I go right back onto it. Aww. And it's, it's been such a cycle. Nothing like that. I've never had any kind of chemical addiction. Uh, I, really, I don't think at all other than this one. And I, I, in later cycles in the last few years, especially like since the kids were born, I have realized that there's kind of an emotional quality to it. It's not just about energy. It's like, I feel good. Like my heart is happy when I am, you know, peaking on caffeine and Mm -hmm. not having that feels like a loss. Like if I don't, like, even if I am perfectly fine, otherwise, like just not having that soaring euphoric feeling feels like something that I'm missing emotionally. And, uh, you know, I'm, I've, I've come to wonder whether it's an associative thing. Like, like you know the stuff some of the stuff that you're talking about seems like it 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 it, ha- it brings with it the sort of corresponding physiological response that you need which is to go to sleep like uh you know i don't think coffee is just about waking up anymore i think it's about feeling good and you know that kind of thing that kind of dependence is always really troubling to me on like an intellectual level like i don't want to feel dependent on molecules to be a certain way uh but but then again it's just like whatever works right like the it, as long as like you said it's as long as it's not causing you know horrible side effects which i kind of just said in my case sometimes it seems like it is but like they're not that horrible right and maybe it's like worse to be totally flat of affect and depressed <laughs> or, or have no energy or whatever Right. Well, I mean, I think it goes back to the, you know, the precepts and everything. And if you Mm. you think it is, you know, causing you more irritability, but then if you're not drinking it, maybe you're also more irritable. So Uh I don't know. I mean, for sure, like for certain that monks would drink tea. Yeah. You know, and that was never questioned as something that was bad or clouding your judgment or something like that. What could be more Zen than that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, tea is just like a smaller coffee. Yes. Uh, right. It's a slippery slope. 
Um, I mean, I drink, I, I drink tea. I don't drink coffee. Um, but mainly just because it hurts my tummy to drink coffee. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So I, I had to do, I had to stop because of that. But um, still, I, uh, I, I do often wonder who, how people can like drink like a whole pot of coffee every morning and and be okay. Like it's it's still a lot, you know. It's still a lot of. Like you said, it's still a stimulant. Um, maybe. Yeah. I wonder if people are just so reliant on it that they don't really realize how it's affecting them anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that there are lots of levels of it, and like it's never been at that level for me. The the most coffee I've ever had, I've, I've never been multiple coffees in a day, except in like, ev- like w- rare, like extremely tired days. I will maybe have a second cup of coffee sometimes. Never yeah. more like once a month, if that. Uh, but in the morning, the most I, I've I've had like. To, you know, a, well, like a cup of coffee is usually measured as like smaller than a cup, uh, like yeah. six or eight ounces. But like I, I, there, there have been periods of times where I was drinking four cups in the morning, like before breakfast, during breakfast and two after breakfast. And that has, it's been a while since it's been like that, but, but even so like that's, that's like a, that's like a, an intermediate level of coffee compared to the people I've been. I mean, like I've worked with people who just are who are never not drinking coffee. Like they have like a cup of coffee with them all the time. And it gets, it, I get so, I get fried by it. Like if I drink too much, like I physically can't drink anymore. And like, it's sure stomach stuff, but, but even like brain and heart stuff, like I, I just can't. Oh on. yeah. And, and so I feel like you people really do build up a tolerance that, that, uh, you know, I can't imagine. Well, and I also hear people just be like, I will commit suicide if I don't have coffee in the morning. You know, like, like pe- people are just that, that like, just, this is, this is as important to my life as oxygen. And that I, I've never gotten anywhere close to that kind of feeling either. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's an addictive drug is, is, is what it is. Like you, 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 I mean, even though that all sounds like totally terrifying and, and alien to me. Like I, even at the level that I'm at, I'm definitely addicted to it and definitely, you know, can't. Oh get yeah. It out of my life. It's, it's interesting. Like, I think you, we are addicted to a lot of things in, in actuality, but like, it's not a clinical addiction. Like, it, you mm. know, you have to, it, to be a clinical addiction, it really has to like cause problems with your relationships or, or your work or, um, right. Prevent you There's from like a social stuff, definition but, of addiction. Uh, I'm certainly addicted to quite a few things. Like I have to have a piece of dark chocolate every single day. And when I don't like, I really miss it. It could be like, I could go a whole week without it and think about it every day that (laughs) Mm -hmm. I really wish I could have had that dark chocolate. Mm. And I try to limit myself to just one, but I mean, that ends up being like a bar of chocolate a week. So (laughs) Mm. I don't know. I feel like I, I, I'm I can't re- tell if that's bad. If that's a bad amount, it doesn't seem like a bad amount of chocolate to me. That seems like a fine amount of chocolate. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's say. just up to up to us to decide what what the bad amount of dark chocolate is. That emotional thing that you just described sounds familiar enough to me that I'm tempted to say that that's like an analogous level of of. I don't want to use. I don't want to la- label you with the word dependence, but like. I will think about coffee in that sort of, uh, wistful way. Uh, you know, like look forward to it. Like if it's like 8 PM and I'm wiped out and I'm thinking about the next day and how hard it's going to be, there's like, Oh, at least I get to have coffee. Yeah. I mean like you don't really get to turn off. I mean, when you're working full time and you have children, like you can't just be like, Okay, I'm gonna go take a nap, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Everybody leave me alone, okay? Yeah. Um, and I'm finding that with just work too. Like, I didn't sleep well last night. I did fine. Like, apparently, you can get adrenaline, and that can work just like coffee. But, (laughs) um, but I don't get to take a nap, and I don't get to just like chill out if I'm tired, like I used to. Like, I'm just Mm -hmm. gonna go. 
lay in bed or something, you know. Um, so I I can see why people turn turn to coffee. Mm-hmm. But but why you know why are we thinking these these stimulants are bad or are not zen? You know, um, is the question. Yeah, I mean, it's not the stimulants themselves to me that feels like it's a, it's a concern for. I mean, it's just it's my ability to handle them. Like it's my ability to handle anything else. It's a it it jacks up the tension in my body and the the reactivity and the mm-hmm. impulsiveness and also there's a definite like cognitive effect of caffeine to me like a like a a hyper cognitive this is why it's so good for the kind of work that people in our civilization do that we power with coffee it's like it makes you think brilliant thoughts and create mm-hmm. crystal mind palaces and like that is the thing that feels like the biggest Zen concern about it. It's like thinking drugs. It's ma- it's 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 causing concepts to happen left and right. And like the that it's part of the focus that it brings on. But then that's that's exactly what I'm describing is getting so hard for me in terms of switching context. Like the Crystal Mind Palace is built and it's like functioning and the flags are flapping in the breeze. And then like, yeah. you know, something happens and like all of the crystals shatter and the palace falls down. And like that, that is the, the Zen, the Zen prescription for that problem is don't build crystal palaces in your mind. And then there's nothing to shatter. Yeah. But yet we drink tea like after meditating and during like Dharma talks. Yeah. To get our mind, conceptual minds working. Yeah, and then, like, the whole, like, um, I forgot what it was. Yeah, see, I'm very tired. I need a cup of coffee right now. <laughs> I don't recommend that at one bit. No, I definitely wouldn't, because then I wouldn't fall asleep. <laughs> Do you think, like, if you were to, you know, having having caffeine and then meditating, is that, like, Mm-hmm. cheating or is it harder for you <laughs> well it's non-negotiable <laughs> at this point it's like i have to sit at five in the morning so i have to use caffeine to wake myself and there's no way i could practice otherwise i know what you mean by the cheating thing but i don't i don't i don't think there's any way let's just limit it to that like i don't think there's any way that caffeine can che- help you cheat at zazen because if you have too much caffeine you're just making it harder practice, you know, like that's, that's, if you can, if you can drink four cups of coffee and then do Zazen, like you're a Zen master. Like, I don't care what anyone else thinks. Like (laughs) if you, if you're able to handle that and stay on the cushion, like you go. Okay. Well, we'll listen to this then. So like there's, and I might've talked about this before, but there's like sort of a psychological thing where like the context of what you do something in it's easier to conjure up the memories and like things that you've learned inside that context. Hmm. So people who learned things scuba diving underwater couldn't uh-huh. recall that information outside of the water uh-huh. or not well. It didn't do as well. So if you're drinking coffee or caffeine of some sort every time you're meditating like what if the 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 lessons you've learned while meditating can only be conjured when you're drinking coffee or tea well well, this is the other part of what i was going to say about how it's not cheating like i don't first of all i don't really relate to zazen as a thing that i learn lessons from like not during zazen like i there are lessons associated with my practice but they come to me at random times in sitting in zazen is an experience of just my body doing whatever it's doing like and like you sure you could use the language learning lessons to describe some of what's happening but it's not like a mental learning of cognitive or even verbal lessons it's like the body is opening the mind is dropping down into the body like an experience is taking place and in the same way that, you know, your body can be tired sometimes in Zazen or awake other times in Zazen, like caffeine is just another one of those conditions to me. And, you know, just, just like 
pain or the absence of pain or having to go to the bathroom or the absence of having to go to the bathroom, hunger or not hungry. Like there's one that's like even more directly analogous. Like you can control whether you're hungry or not, you know? You and, can. And, and, uh, it's to me, to me, it's the same. And, and you have to learn to practice with, you know, whatever, whatever is there in the body. And, and like I said, you know, caffeine has more risks to the ability, I think, the ability to sit zazen than it has, you know, benefits. Like, sure, the benefit of staying awake instead of falling asleep, like, that's a real thing. But the line is so close to that of, like, mind racing, can't stop thinking, can't stop, you know, getting, like, wanting to get up. There, there. It's so close. The, the level of caffeine that's enough to keep you awake is so close to the level of caffeine that makes zazen impossible. That you know, it's it's uh, something that kind of regulates itself. Like I, I, if I drank more caffeine than I do before zazen, I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, because you might start thinking about some things you need to do. Yeah, and then I would want to go do them. So. It's a fine balance, but like the, the sure, like staying awake in Zazen is a real challenge. Like it's one of the fundamental challenges. And to, to me, like it's what, whatever you got to do to stay awake, get hit with a stick. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Householders is a production of the Atlanta Soto Zen Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Silent Thunder Order. Find us on the web at ASZC.org. Our sangha depends on your support. You can donate by PayPal to donate at storder.org. Gasho.